Hey, thank you, uh, Jim, for that warm introduction. <laughs> Appreciate it. Hey, well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here back at McAleese. I know you just had uh, Jim Rainey uh, speak to you. Incredible officer. Uh, I've known Jim since he was a battalion commander. He took over command uh, in Iraq um, and went on to distinguish himself leading troops in the job, and then was the main effort uh, during the Battle of Fallujah. So he is a seasoned warfighter. He's the right person to lead uh, Futures Commands, and we could not be more pleased with what he's doing there, and I'll talk a little more about that as we go. go. You know, so it's great to be back here. Um, yeah, as you know, we, I, I, I had the privilege of speaking here last year, and that was less than two weeks after Russia invaded Ukraine, less than two weeks. And yet American soldiers were already on the ground in Europe, they're reassuring our NATO allies of our ironclad commitment, and not just the soldiers assigned to Europe, but thousands who left the continental United States on no-notice deployments. So here we are today. We're still giving our full support to Ukraine as they continue to hold their own in defense of their nation, defense of their freedom, and their very lives. Now, Russia had a very complex plan to conduct an unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. And, but as we're all seeing over the past year, the proofs in the execution. And as we've seen, most wars are not short. They are not bloodless. They are not cheap. And they are not won by a few exquisite weapon systems. I would argue that there's four factors that assess the Army's potential or the, uh, for success on the battlefield. And one thing I would add, too, about these conflicts is regional conflicts affect the entire world. Regional conflicts have global implications, and everyone should understand that when they start thinking about some of the things they may do in the national security and environment. But anyways, let's talk about some of the things that we are using to help us assess potential for success on the battlefield. I call them C3W. And you always need an acronym uh, in this line of work, right? That's kind of what we do. And it starts with the first C is capabilities. Does that army have the capabilities to defend itself? Does it have the capabilities, weapon system, they need to defend their country? Capacity. Do they have enough of these systems to defend their country? Third, do they have the competence? Are there soldiers trained on those systems. And fourth, and most importantly, the W, do their soldiers have the will to fight? Do they have the will to fight? And that's probably the most important and one of the most difficult to predict. What happens when things get really hard, when things get really rough, when you're taking casualties? And that's one thing that I've been very, very impressed with the Ukrainians is they have the will to fight and they have the will to defend their country. And so when we think about our strategy and when it comes to deterrence, these factors are involved. And it comes back, it all goes back to peace through strength. And the best way to win without fighting is to demonstrate you can win by fighting. And that means having a strong joint force, strong alliances and partnerships with strong allies and partners. You know, we have a long history of that whether it's with Special Forces or the National Guard partnering with countries through the State Partnership Program or through many military exchanges. And what you're seeing us do right now is we're investing a lot more in our allies and partners. And that's why we stood up six Security Force Assistant Brigades. And they are operating throughout the world right now, working very closely with our allies and partners, along with Special Forces, along with our National Guard, along with our conventional forces, because again, it's peace through strength. And our strength comes certainly from having a strong army, a strong joint force, and strong allies and partners is extremely important. And we're doing a lot more than just combined training events. We're doing experimentation, and Jim Rainey had a little talk about that. But when, the reason that's so important the reason it's important that our allies and partners are integrated, not interoperable, just, but integrated, is that's the secret sauce of convergence in the future. And what we're seeing is many of our allies and partners are recognizing the importance of that, 
We're seeing that they know that they need to have the capabilities, capacity, and competence if they're going to have the will to fight and the will to deter in this environment. And that's why it's so important. And I talked about Jim Rainey, great leader of Futures Command, doing great stuff. You're going to see Futures Command shift as we, as we move into the future. But the second thing is he has partnered with Honorable Doug Bush over at ASOL. And I tell you, they are a great team. They're working very, very closely together. Uh, that's how our system operates with checks and balances. And they are going to deliver uh, a whole bunch of systems at the speed of relevance. And I see them doing that. And as you all know, it's very, very challenging in this environment with all the things that go on to get systems into the hands of soldiers at the speed of relevance. But they are doing that. And as we've talked about, you've heard my mantra, 24 and 23, right? We're trying to get that done, 24 systems, 23. Uh, we have COVID, we've got CRs, we've got protests, we've got a lot of stuff going on. But we are consistent and persistent, and we are going to make that stuff happen. So here's the latest. Eight systems are being fielded right now. Six systems are being tested, and 10 systems will undergo soldier touch points. And is it going to be perfect, you know, when you're writing about this, hey, the chief said that you're going to have 24 and 23, and this one is a month later, too. Hey, that's, that's the way it goes, okay? Um, but with the industry, I mean, stay with us. We are uh, totally and aggressively committed to pursuing our greatest transformation in over 40 years. And consistent and persistent. And I won't be around forever, but for those who come after me, you have to stay consistent. You have to stay persistent. There's going to be lots of folks, you know, saying, you know, why we can't do things or what should happen, you know, and stuff like that. But the way you win uh, in a bureaucracy, the way you win in combat is you stay consistent and persistent. And when things get hard, that's when the tough get going. So we got the right people doing this, and I'm very excited about that. You know, 50 years ago, we were coming out of Vietnam and, and, and years of counterinsurgency operations. And our Army senior leaders, they watched what was going on in the 1973 Arab-Israeli War. And from that, they took their lessons and they incorporated them into the Army's last greatest transformation. That transformation gave us the doctrine, airland battle, it gave us the organizations, it gave us the training, it gave us the weapon systems that we used to win so decisively in Desert Storm. If you think about it, it took 17 years. You know, uh, 1973 to 1990, 17 years. So start to think about that, how that plays. And history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but sometimes it does rhyme. And, you know, when we take a look at where we are right now, we're in 2023. We're not only supporting Ukraine, but what we're doing is watching and learning and incorporating lessons into our transformation. And this is really important because as the battle has unfolded, and we saw this, and you know, during the initial battle, we saw the success of small groups of soldiers with javelins and stingers. And people were coming to me early on saying, hey, I guess, General, we don't need tanks anymore. And what I said then, I'll say right now, only if you don't want to win. And it's not just tanks. It, there we go. All right. There we go. All right. You can write that one down, too. But it, it's, it's not just tanks. It's combined arms. You know, you win by effectively executing well-coordinated combined arms operations. That includes armor, it includes infantry, artillery, aviation, logistics, and, and even more important, you win as a joint force, as an integrated joint force, and more importantly, you win as an integrated combined force. So combined joint forces doing com combined operations is what it's all about. And let me talk about logistics. You know. You know, that, that old cliche about, you know, uh, amateur study tactics and professional study logistics, that is playing out right now uh, in, in this war from the tactical to strategic level. Anyone know the difference between a tank and a 70-ton paperweight? Logistics, right? There it is. It's, and uh, we're very fortunate that we have the world's greatest log logisticians, and we really do, and, and all of you are part of that. You're kind of coming together, you know, to, to get the, you know, that the capabilities and the capacity that uh, Ukrainians or us need to be successful 
on the battlefield. And I, I'm going to see a lot of them tomorrow, so I'll pass on your thanks. We're going down to uh, Redstone to welcome Charles Hamilton as the next commander of Army Material Command and thank Ed Daly, Ed Daly, whose team and him have just done incredible, miraculous work in supporting Ukraine. And it, it's, if you could only see what they have done. Uh, it just makes you so proud of our, our logistician. And then there's the concept of multi-domain operations, which officially became the, the, our, our war fighting concept in last October. And it's not perfect, but we're learning a lot from that, and we are updating that as we speak, and we're seeing it play out in Ukraine right now. You know, if you think back, our, 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 our uh, war fighting concept was air, land, battle. Air, land, battle. Well, we got a few other you know, domains there we need to kind of bring into consideration. And what we're seeing is we're being contested, or we will be contested in every single domain. Certainly on the land, we're seeing it uh, contest, be, being contested in the sea, ships are getting sunk. We're seeing air, contesting the air, airplanes are getting shot down, helicopters are getting down, we're going to be other, contested there. We're seeing cyber play out, and we're seeing the important role of space. All this is coming together, and we're going to have to be ready to fight in and fight across multiple domains, and that's why the joint force and our allies are, and partners are so important. This is one of the reasons that we're standing up our multi-domain task forces, and we see them having a critical role in the future, designed to provide multiple options to the combatant commanders and present multiple dilemmas to our adversaries. And I can envision in, in, in the future where a commander asks us to assist in, in, in putting in place a no-sail zone, with anti-ship capability or no-fly zone with a layered air and missile defense as part of the joint force. And you're all going to help us deliver that and we're in the process of delivering that too. The other thing is really important, you don't do long-range precision targeting without long-range, um, uh, you don't do long-range precision fires without long-range precision targeting. And as all you know, and we, we appreciate that, we are providing an array of long-range precision fires this year, or close to the end of this year, with hypersonics, uh, a mid-range capability that's going to sink ships, and the prison strike missile, which we think is going to be incredibly effective because it's going to ride in high Mars. And for some of those who thought, you know, that, hey, what, what are you doing long-range precision fires? I just say, hey, take a look at what's going on. And they are in tremendous high demand. They're going to be able to do that. The other thing about effects, long-range precision effects, you know, the capability we'll have in the multi-domain task force is the ability for intelligence, information operations, cyber, electronic warfare, and space operations. They're all going to play out. We're all going to have to be able to work, work that. And we're seeing them play out right now in Ukraine. And that is driving our thought process, and that's driving how we're thinking about this. We already have three of these multi-domain task forces, two in the Pacific, one in Europe and working very well, and we're going to stand up two more. So we'll have five, at least five, in the very near future. And you know, as, we, as we talk about some of the other things that we're building up, you know, right now on the long-range precision fires, the hypersonics battery is already built, the mid-range battery is already built, the, the prism batteries are all standing, all this stuff is just a matter of getting the systems, and I know industry is going to deliver them with success on time at the speed of relevance and we're excited about that. We're also building a lot of air and missile defense organizations because we're seeing how important that is to protect um, our organizations. So we're, we're standing up nine indirect fire protection capability units, IFPIC. We'll come up with a new name, but we've got to have a name with an acronym, and you know, that's what we got right now. But it's a lot, nine. We're, you know, I've talked about this before unmanned aerial systems on the battlefield. We're standing up nine counter UAS um, uh, units. We're building four mobile protected fire units. Uh, people say don't call them light tanks. To me, they're light tanks. We can call them whatever you want, but they're, they're light tanks. They're gonna be there to support the infantry and we're excited about uh, delivering them. Uh, we're also recognizing the importance of information operations. And so we're building theater information advantage attachments. So we're gonna have those capabilities in the Army. 
So this is how we are getting ready for the next fight. And, you know, we're going to build these organizations with a flat budget and a flat end stream. So guess what? Some things we're going to have to take a hard look at. We're going to have to take a hard look at the resources we have. We're going to have to take a hard look at the organizations we have. Some of you will look at organizations and they may not look the same in the future because we're going to have to optimize across our organizations. So you'll see some structure changes as we start to move in the future and we're developing that right now and you will see that coming because what we're doing is we're building combat credible forces. They're going to be best utilized for the, for the, in support of the national defense strategy and we take a look at Indo-Pacific and we take about what type of uh, systems we need, what type of units we need. And so we're going to build combat credible forces, we're not going to build hollow forces. And, but here's the deal, at the end of the day, none of this happens without getting the right people in the right place. And as I've often said, people are our greatest strength, they're our most important weapon system, and we win through our people. And last week, and I'm really excited, I don't get very excited in this job, but I am really excited because we just launched the return of Be All You Can Be. I'm like pumped up, okay? I, 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 you know, I look around, and I know a lot of you, and you're, you're old like me, and uh, you know, I came in the Army Commission in 1981. That's the same year that Be All You Can Be first premiered, and, and we've had other slogans, other things. I've sat in a lot of those meetings going, I don't like this. Well, you're old, we're not trying to recruit you, but no one liked them either, you know, so I won't say, you know. <laughs> But, but anyways, think about it. You know, if you're a parent, answer the question why. Why should my kid go in the Army? Because you want him or her to be all they can be, right? I won't say some of the other ones, but anyways, think of, take, take of some of the other slogans. Why should my kid go in the Army? Because they'll be a, a one, or they'll be this or that. Anyway, so we are, we are bringing that into place. We've done a lot of testing, which is really interesting. This resonates with the young men and women today. It's really pretty cool, it does. And we just had, got lucky, we had Jonathan Majors, if you've seen the commercials. Um, I didn't know who he was, I should. He's got the number, as he explained to me, I asked him if he was busy, he goes, he was general, I get the number one in two movie in the globe. And we're like, yeah, you're probably a little busy, you know? But, but he is talking about the history, he's helping us present the Army to uh, young men and women, and, and we are just really excited, you know, about what, what is going down. And, you know, as we tell people, you can do anything you want to do in the United States Army. In fact, you could be all you can be. Yeah. Anyways, you know, I would ask for all of you out there, you know, your influences, we need your help. We need your help in inspiring young men and women to answer the call to serve. Not necessarily in the military, it could be anywhere, but, you know, the Army's a good place to go, too. So think about that when you're out there talking to people. Um, we need it. We want to make sure that uh, this nation is protected and we are ready to go. And, and so what I will, what will end with is, you know, I'm just incredibly proud of our soldiers, Active Guard and Reserve, I, I believe, and, and, and I stand that, that we have the best army in the world because of our soldiers and because of our people, and we need to keep it that way. So take, uh, open to your questions, thank you. Good to see you. Uh, one, one quick question. Yeah. One of the things that kind of surprised me about the Ukraine fight was the almost instant application of SpaceX Starlink. Yeah. How do we think about bringing in some of these commercial applications as augmentation of the military and evolve the tactics very quickly? Is that something you're trying to wrestle with? No, ab absolutely. I, you know, I, I, I think we've got to use what's in place. Um, you know, we shouldn't care about where we get it from. Uh, you know, the, the thing about, you know, SpaceX, and as a lot of people have seen it, we've, we've all taken a look at low Earth orbit, you know. We know that you're going to have to have multiple paths. When I take a look at, you know, uh, things like communications, when I take a look at supply chains and things like that, um, I don't like supply chains because it's only as good as the weakest link. And what we need is to think about networks and fabrics and have multiple options. You know, I always tell my folks, you never want to be a one option commander. So if you're dependent on one satellite, or you're dependent on a couple satellites, or you're depending on satellites for communications, or you're dependent on space for uh, global position satellite, GPS, what do you do when something goes wrong? 
What's your, you know, that's your primary, what's your alternate? And, and that's what we're trying to do throughout the system is, is get resilience. Get resilience and, you know, if we have access to those systems, good. What happens when they go down? And what we're finding, and this is really, you know, kind of the secret sauce to me about convergence. Um, you know, when I, when I talk about the future, I talk about, I talk about speed, I talk about range, and I talk about convergence. So if, if you want to bring effects on the enemy, so, you know, we're, we're getting these great systems. They go really fast, you know, hypersonics, look at how fast that thing goes, you know. Look at how far that, that, that thing is going to go. Same thing with aircraft. We got aircraft that go much faster and much farther, and we need them because of the ranges we're going to deal with. But the secret is convergence. How quickly can you get those lethal means onto a target? So if you get, you know, if you have a target and it takes you 20 hours to actually do that, then, you know, you're not going to get the effects you need. I, I used to say that when I was 101st commander, you know, we get these helicopters that go 150 miles an hour, but if it takes us 15 hours to plan and 15 hours to get off the ground, we're only moving at 10 miles an hour, you might as well buy a truck and save yourself $30 million. That's, you know, some people like that, but that's what I used to say. But, you know, it, so you've got to get fast. And, 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 and when, the reason I come back around to communications is it's all about data. How quickly can we move data, you know, and, and having, you know, space capability and having terrestrial capability and in between, plenty of ways to do it because that is going to be where we're most successful is how quickly can you move information? How can you get it into some type of integrated battle command system? And then how quickly can you get to the shooters so you can buy the lethal effects you need? I'll win in the back straight ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Matt Baynard from Penn State. Um, you mentioned previously that you, know, you want the focus for replenishing equipment sent to Ukraine to be with upgraded capabilities rather than new old stuff. Uh, right. So with the budget request out now, what are some specific examples you point to uh, in the request that are either you know, supporting that directly or even accelerating that effort? Well, I'll give you an example. In some it's in the budget, some it's in the supplemental. So, you know, you all look at that stuff. But I mean, <laughs> bottom line is, you know, I, I think the best example is M113s, the armored personnel carriers. Those have been serving, anyone that's been serving over 60 years probably remembers them uh, running around. And so, you know, we want to buy the MV. You know, we're not going to buy new old stuff. Uh, you know, we're taking a look at 777s. Um, and what we're buying is high Mars, and in some cases to replace that. Uh, you know, as far as on stingers, we're taking a look at um, purchasing upgraded stingers. And, and really, with all the type systems, if we have a system that's coming in to replace that system, we don't want to buy, as I've said, new old stuff. We want to we want to modernize the force while we're doing that. And we really appreciate appreciate Congress's support on that. We've talked to you know our committees, and and so far. Uh, they have been very supportive of doing that, um, you know, along with a lot of other things we need to do. And you're seeing, you know, invest in the organic industrial base. Um, you know, again, getting back to supply chains. You don't want to be a one option commander. You don't want to have one option. And even worse, you don't want to be dependent on critical uh, assets coming from maybe outside the country. So we've got to make sure we have that. One other thing that I'll add that, you know, we're talking about is we may have to do things differently. You know, some of our, 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 our weapon systems have very long lead items, you know, so you want a certain missile. It may take you two years to get that one item. So, you know, but we may not want to buy a whole bunch of extra missiles because they're really expensive and, and you sit on the shelf and those that have evolved in ammunition management, if you don't use them, you spend a lot of money either extending their life or demilitarizing, you, you go through this cycle of doing that. So we may need to, you know, get to the point where we just buy the critical components, and they sit in the shelf. And so we took the, the time to produce from two years maybe to three months, because we already have the, the long lead items ready to go. Now, that's a different way of thinking, trying to solve that problem, but we're gonna have to be innovative, at least from where I sit, so we can get the best army we can with the resources we get. Robert, yeah. I'm John, my name is Harry Kelsell, I'm a lawyer in private practice formerly at the Pentagon, and I was going to ask you, there's been a lot of discussion about the armaments that are going to the Ukraine, and among those questions was, what are we doing? Where are we depleting all of our resources? And sec the second issue was, why is it taking so long to get some of those very critical materials over to the Ukraine? Thank you, sir. Okay, so the first question is, um, 
Are we depleting all of our resources to do that? Um, I've been very open to that. We, we, every, everything they request, uh, we take a look at. We, you know, we, we take a look at our stocks. We, we know what our requirements are, and we want to make sure that um, those requirements, ammunition and weapon systems, are replenished. And we have to do that. And we're watching it very, very carefully because, you know, you never know in this business. You don't want to be a one-option commander. We may have to go do something else, and we need to make sure that we have the ammunition we're doing. And, and, and the good thing is I think a lot of people are learning. There are a lot of lessons being learned. You know, we thought, hey, you know, who, who would have thought that you'd expend over a million rounds of 155 mil? Last time we've done that has been a long time. And so we're starting to get a lot smarter on usage rates. And, and we're seeing the country recognize that we need to invest in the organic industrial base because, you know, you tend not to. You know, you tend, if you don't need to, you know, we're all got constrained resources, so we're investing in that so we have the capability to do that. And the second piece was, I've said before, is we're modernizing the Army. We want to do that while we're providing uh, these capabilities uh, to them. Then as far as, as, far as getting, um, equipment to Ukraine, if you take a look at what we've delivered to them, you know, millions of rounds of this, all these type of weapon systems, if you, if you add it up, uh, you know, I am really proud of what our logisticians are doing. And, and quite frankly, they're delivering those systems when we're told to do them, at least from the Army standpoint, and at a pretty good speed of relevance to get them there. The other thing that's happened is, you know, it's not just about having the weapon system. And what I think is really amazing for the Ukrainians is they're taking our weapon systems and very complex weapon systems like Patriots and tanks and, and not tanks, uh, uh, infantry fighting vehicles and strikers and, and they learn how to use them. And, and they're doing it, you know, in a, in, in a very rapid manner. If you talk to the trainers, they are most impressed with the Ukrainian soldiers that are coming out of Ukraine. They come into, you know, some of the places we're training them and they are getting trained as fast, if not faster than our soldiers. And we have never seen you know, soldiers from another country learn so quickly, be so focused and committed, and they are coming in and they're studying at night, they're getting ready to go, they're not taking advantage of maybe being outside a war zone, and they are doing a great job. So that's what we're doing with that, okay? Thank you. Sir, we have time for one last question. Okay, perfect, okay. Go ahead. Hi. Can you hear me? Just shout it out. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Jen Judge with Defense News. Hi, Jen. Thank you. Uh, so on Army Preposition stock in FY24, it seems like there is some additional funding. Uh, so I'm just curious how much of that may potentially be to work on APS uh, rebalancing and organizing, plussing up in the Pacific region. Um, how you're thinking about that, those plans at this point. I know that they've been in flux. You've been trying to figure out what's right. So if you give us a little bit more of a sense of that, and then on the multi-domain task force, you have three that you're standing up to in the Pacific, one in Europe. Do you have any more uh, fidelity on what you plan to do for the last two, potentially maybe the last two MDTFs, um, and where they might go, what the time is for standing those up? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with, the, I'll kind of work my way. I'll start with the multi-domain task forces. Amazingly, there's a lot of interest in where they want to go. We're getting a, a lot of people volunteering uh, what we want to do. And, you know, I think a, a, as we take a look at it, you know, the, the multi-domain task forces are, um, you know, positioned right now, uh, one in Hawaii, one in uh, JBLM. Um, we're, we're certainly focused on um, another one, possibly uh, in the Pacific, because that's where we think it best used. The exact location and how that plays out, we're, we're not really ready to you know, uh, talk about that to the point, because there are some things we'd like to do. And when you look at the multi-domain task forces, you know, the things that we can rotate, we can move, and, and they're really designed to provide a lot of capability and people go, well, where are you gonna put them exactly, especially if it's you know, overseas and um, with what's going on right now, um, we are looking at making sure we have the capability and then as things develop, we can move them very, very quickly to be at, at the point of need. So I, I can see three in the Pacific uh, and then one other one, um, we got one in Europe and then one probably in a contingency site place where it can go wherever we need. So I think that's how those five are gonna play out. Um, getting back to, um, let me go back up. The first question was, I'm trying to, uh, it's, yeah, the preposition stock. A couple of things. First of all, 
we know the importance of pre-positioned stock. And you know, we saw it in Europe, and it was interesting. We, we saw someone say, hey, your, your tanks are only at 90% or something like that. I go, wow, that's pretty, you know, the, you know we were able to you know, move them. And you know, I'm sitting there, because I've, I've been out here, and I'm going, wow, I'm, I'm so impressed with the, I, I just met with the first infantry, uh, one three uh, infantry that was the brigade that went into uh, Europe, picked up their tanks in seven days when shooting on a range. And, you know, I guess people did a report, and we love reports, and we love feedback, and they're going, wow, the tanks were only at this. I go, wait a minute, they were shooting on a range. We moved an Army Brigade combat team in seven days. And anyone that's done anything like that, to me, it's just short of miraculous. Were there probably problems with everything not perfect? Absolutely. But what we know is we want those capabilities of pre-positioned stocks. We've got to get them forward. We've got to make sure they're modernized. We've got to make sure they're maintained. That costs money. There's a whole bunch of logisticians that have to be there. You know, just like you have an old car in the garage, you leave it sitting there for nine months, it's not going to work. And if you don't take care of it and, and supply it and all those type things, it won't work. So, you know, we're very looking at the Pacific. There's things that, that, that we're putting together. A lot of these things are driven by policy and, and uh, diplomacy on how much we can get forward or how much we can, but we are in the process of um, exploring that and there's, there's more interest um, with people learning what happened in Ukraine. So. Well spoken, sir. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you all.